study, so we continue here. The idea for today is to review what we have done to, uh, so far in this course with a different model. This model will be a little bit more complicated, not too much, but will allow us to do a bit less trivial things, less trivial checks. So let me first present the model. I mean, you don't need to, uh, let's say, know all the details of the model or the motivation for this model, but okay, this is a model we presented last year uh, related to some flavor uh, anomalies and it's based on an extended gauge symmetry so in addition to the standard model gauge group we have this additional U1X and uh, in addition to the standard model particle content which is uncharged under this U1X we have some additional stuff we have some vector-like fermions basically you have a copy of the standard model works but vector-like and with a charge 2 under this U1X and a copy of the vector light of the standard model leptons, vector light copy, with a charge again too. Okay? So these are the new fermions of the model. And we also have, and there is one generation for each. Uh, and then also we have two additional scalars. This one, which is, uh, which is uh, or you will see that it's going to be responsible for the breaking of the additional U1x, which we call phi. And there is an additional scalar. Uh, with a charge minus one, which is going to be our dark matter candidate in the model. Okay, so it's a very simple model, just an extended gauge symmetry with additional fermions and additional scalars, and everything is here. Very simple model. So there are additional Lagrangian terms. Since these guys are vector-like, which means that left-handed and right-handed parts uh, have exactly the same representation under the, the gauge group, under everything. Uh, you're allowed to write down uh, mass terms in the Lagrangian, which are gauge invariant. Then, in addition, you can write down, you can easily check that because due to this charge plus 2, you can form invariants that couple these fermions with the standard model fermions and this additional scale. And these are these invariants. So you have this lambda Q coupling with the standard model quark, this phi field and this additional port, and basically a parallel coupling with the left. So this is the left on doublet, this is the new uh, scalar, and this is the new Fermi in this one. Okay? So this is everything you have in this model. It's actually very simple. Now, uh, symmetry breaking takes place basically, uh, I mean, the additional U1X piece is going to be broken by this phi field, as I said already. And the standard model gauge group is going to be broken by this, by the standard model X. Nothing special. The breaking, the spontaneous breaking of the U1X piece will give rise to a massive cell prime, as usual, and the mass of this guy will be proportional to the new gauge coupling times the bed of the new field. And a factor of 2 due to normalization. That's what important. And finally, and this is also interesting in this model, uh, if you write down the most complete scalar potential that you are allowed to write, you realize that there, uh, due to the U1x symmetry, even after you break the gate symmetry with this bed, there is a remnant set to symmetry. So you don't impose this set to symmetry, but just appears after symmetry breaking, you may say accidentally, in the, in the Lagrangian. And this is actually very easy to see. Since the, the charges for these two scalars are like this, every time you have this, you need two of these guys. Because this is a 2 and this is a minus 1. That's why you are allowed to write down only these terms in the Lagrangian. So you have uh, all these um, quadratic terms in this sky field. Then even if you break the symmetry with the phi field, there will be always a set to symmetry that makes this sky field completely stable. Uh, it works the same that this is a defined mass because you are ignoring kinetic mixing, I guess. I'm not ignoring, but that doesn't change it. Uh, actually, that thing is anyway, I can talk it later, but... I'm not ignoring. I, I will put it to zero in the end. But it's there in the model, so you can put it different from zero. But that is also even, it does not break exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
But I think he's asking about this formula. Yeah, this, uh, it also senses if there is mixing, you want mixing, then the J prime mass also senses the liquid here. Ah, you are correct. There will be another term which is proportional to the mixing, to the G1x or Gx1. Yes. You are correct. Okay. Yeah, this is only valid if I neglect that mix. Also, it's based on the assumption that this bed will always be much larger than the others. And also the gauge coupling will be much larger, like order one. So even if you have the mixing, this will be approximately true. But you are correct. Technically speaking, there are other terms. Okay, so this is basically the model. Very few elements. So today we are going to take this model, we are going to implement the model in, in SARA. It's already done and you can download the files from the, from the website of the course. This is, the, this is called Dark BS, this is the name that I gave to this model. And uh, then we are going to compute things with Sphino, with MicroVega, and with Batra. This is basically the plan for today. So if you have any question, any doubt, any curiosity, maybe today is going to be solved. If not, if not uh, just ask me, and then we'll try to, to solve it. Can you show again the captains of Phi and Kai, Phi and Kai separately? They are here. No, in the Yukawa. Ah, the Yukawa is only Phi appears in the Yukawa. Okay, the other is in there. Also, by assumption, phi doesn't yeah. get a bed. The bed of phi of chi is here, by assumption. Okay. So the set 2 is not broken. Okay. So, as I said, you can download the, the model files for Shara from the, from the website. So, what I'm going to do now is to review these model files, to comment on the most important details of these model files, in particular, the main differences with respect to the scototelic model, so that we can understand uh, these differences. Okay, and as I said, there is a file called darkvs, darkdc, that you can download from the website. Once you download it, you open it with this usual command. Okay, and then here you have the usual model files that we have typically inside. Okay. So I have to move this folder inside the model uh, folder in in Sara. So I move it to Sara models. Then let me go there. So now let me review the main content of this uh, model file and then you will see that it's not so complicated to implement any model inside. Okay, well, as for the scotogenic model, first you have to provide some minimal information, like the name of the model, blah, blah, blah. And then you start with the symmetries. Okay, I said that in this model there is a, a remnant set to symmetry after you break the U1. In principle, this thing here is actually not required, it should be automatic, because this symmetry is not imposed, it appears in the Lagrange map. However, for practical reasons, you have to define it anyway. And this is because Micromega, which uh, we are going to use it later, needs to know which is the stable particle, and it doesn't know physics. So you have to kind of pinpoint say, okay, this is the particle that is going to be stable. So even though this set to symmetry is automatic, it's not imposed in the, in the model, you have to specify it anyway. So we have this set to symmetry here. Then we have the four gauge groups, the U1 hypercharge, SU2, SU3, and then this additional gauge group that we have here. We call the gauge coupling GX, and uh, we call the gauge boson BT, or P prime, if you want. Okay, this is like the B boson that you have for the U1 hypercharge, but then you want B prime. Then you have the standard model particle content, or fermion content, which is given in these lines. Everything is exactly the same as in the standard model, with only one difference, which is this zero here, which is the charge under the new U1x, and this one here, which is the charge under the new set 2 symmetry. So these guys, the standard model fermions, are singlets, and they're both the U1x and the set 2. Did you check the anomalies, the gauge, triangle anomalies? Sarah does it for me. <laughs> this is one of the things Sarah checks. Just, but this is—it's it, trivial that it will work. 
because it's vector of light. Yeah, so yeah. the left handed and the right handed are always cancelled. Okay? So the and only particles that carry the extra U1 are the vector lights. Yes. <coughs> yes. That's why you don't have to. Sure. <coughs> okay, now we have the new fermions, which are given in these four lights. And as you can see, they are exact copies of the standard model fermions. For example, the first line, you can compare it to this line, to the electron doublet. It's exactly the same, with the difference that here you have these two. So this guy has a charge 2 under the U1x. That's the only difference. And we also have to, to create new names for the elements of this doublet. So I will call the new neutrinos V4 and the new charged electrons E4. Okay. Then I have to do the same for the right-handed component. As I said, these are vector-like fermions, meaning that left-handed and right-handed, they are both doublets. Okay? So I have to define them independently. And this is done in the next slide. Okay? And remember, this is something that I told you, all the fermions in SARA have to be left-handed. That's why this is actually the conjugate. I didn't write conjugate because I wanted to save time, but this E5 is actually the conjugate of a right-handed fermion. And this V5 is the conjugate of a right-handed fermion. That conjugate explains why the hypercharge is one half instead of minus one half, and why the u one charge is minus two instead of two, because this is the conjugate. But the rest is the same. It's a doublet, and the SU2, a singlet, and the SU3, and plus, under the set. And, and then I basically repeated the same process but with the quarks, with the vector like quarks, which as you can see are copies of the doublets in the standard model. Okay? And now the scalars, we have first the, the Higgs doublet, the standard model Higgs doublet, then we have this 5 field, which is a singlet under everything but the U1x, and the chi field, which is a singlet under everything but the U1x and has a minus under the set. So we have defined the, the scalars and the fermions. Now we have to define the Lagrangian. Okay, so let me put it here for you. So we have this additional Yukawa, these additional masses. So let me first show the Yukawas and the masses. So these are the standard model Yukawas. Sorry, up to here. These are the standard model Yukawas. So YD, YE, YR exactly the same as in the scotogenic model or as in the standard model. Then we have these additional terms, MQ and ML, which are the new vector-like masses. And then we have lambda Q and lambda L, which are the new Yukawa, this two. Lambda Q and lambda L. Okay, and you can see that we, are used, we have used basically uh, the same notation. Then we have to also write down the terms in the scalar potential, for the Higgs, this is simple, it's just exactly the same as in the spotogenic. So we have the Higgs squared term, and we have here, okay, you can see it better like this, you have here the lambda term, which is the quartic couple of the Higgs. And then, in addition, we have to write these couplings here. So the new couplings that appear because of this, actually not only this coupling, because these are only restricted to the chi field, but also the coupling for the phi field. So a square mass term for the phi field, a quartic term for the phi field, and a term which is quadratic in phi and quadratic in the Higgs. So all these terms are defined here, and if you have a look, you will see that it's very simple. Okay, and this new term, which is not self-conjugate, has to be written separately. But that's it. Okay? So this way we have defined the Lagrangian. Then the next step is the mixing in the gate sector. This is exactly the same as in the scotogenic model with one little difference. Now, in the neutral sector, we have the WB, sorry, the, the B boson, the W3, and in addition, the B prime. So this is what we have here. And then the mass eigenstates will be the photon, the cell, and an additional cell prime. So we have added a new state, both in the gate uh, eigenstates and in the mass eigenstates. For the charge guys, there is no difference at all. So let me continue. Then we have also this 8, 0, and 5, which get best. And we have to decompose them in real and imaginary part, as usual. Exactly the same we did with the photogenic model. So we say that 8, 0 is split into 
the real part, which is here, the imaginary part, which is here, and the vector. And we normalize each piece with 1 over square root of 2. And we do the same thing for the file field, which is the, the new scalar that we have introduced to break the u one x Okay? And now, this is a little bit larger than in the case of the scotogenic, but we have to define the mixings after symmetry breaking. So first we do it for the CP even scalars, so we assume that there is no CP violation, so we can mix them in the, uh, separately. First we do it for the CP even, so this, this field which is defined here is the real component of H0, and this field here is the real component of R. So we mix them, we call the new mass eigenstates HH, and we call the mixing matrix ZH. We do exactly the same for the imaginary components, so for the CP odd scalars, sigma H and sigma P. We call the, the mass eigenstates AH and the mixing matrix ZA. And now we have also mixings in the Fermi sector. So we do, for example, for the downquarks, we have the downquarks in the standard model and the new downquark mixed with the right handed components to give rise to this additional, this new mass eigenstates, which later, you can see here, form the fermions. So this is completely parallel to what we did in the scott model. There is no difference at all. Only more fermions and more scalars. But it's exactly the same process. And we, we are done with this model. Comments? Questions? Yes. Why do you need to uh, define the mass matrix in the pseudo-scalar sector? Because there will be no like physical pseudo-scalar from phi and the standard model level. The only pseudo-scalar will come from phi, right? Because everything will be written by J and J prime. Uh, actually, both. Exactly. I mean, there is no physical state. Yes. So why do you need to define that matrix? Is this that is true. Correct? Actually, we can we can skip that. Yeah, but this is correct. We can skip. Okay, so I continue, so we are done with the So let me now show you some little details which also appear in the other model files, so the parameters.m and the particle.m. So in the parameters.m we have this something related to the podcast comment. We have these additional parameters, g1x and gx1. And this is because in principle, in a model with two U1s, you can always write down an invariant term of this type. So, L mu of one of the couplings, or one of the gauge groups, L mu of the other. This is invariant because individually they are both invariant. Okay. So, um, this uh, type of mixing can be characterized by defining this uh, matrix of gauge couplings, where you have the normal gauge coupling, the diagonal gauge coupling, C1 and GX, and you can introduce this off-diagonal gauge coupling which characterize this epsilon. Okay, so these new couplings which are mixed is this is what the what we have here. This G1x and Gx1. Okay, that's why we have this additional coupling. The rest is basically the same. We have to define how to write them in LaTeX, we have to define uh, the block in the Lechoux uh, format where they will appear, and we have to give them uh, an output name. But it's basically the same. And this is the meaning of these two lines. Also, let me comment on this set H, okay, that we have defined. Oh, maybe I shouldn't close this. This set H is what we have defined as the mixing matrix for the CP even scalars. And it is important to, to define this because we didn't have this in the standard model nor in the stochastic model because in that case we only have one field, we have the, the Higgs and that's it. Here we have two, so we have to define the mixing matrix and also you can see that in this case we have defined some optional dependence so in some analytical expressions the matrix will be parameterized with this alpha input. Okay, but this is optional, this is not something that you have to do always but if you want to use uh, an angle in your calculations this is nice. Also it is very important that we have used this description. I remind you that this description option, what is telling Sara is look for this matrix in the global definition because this matrix might appear 
in some of their models. Okay? There are many models with scalar mixing metrics, like any model with more than one Higgs, basically. So in all two Higgs other models, in all supersymmetric models, you will have these mixing metrics. So by using this description, you are telling Sarah that you have identified this matrix with that one. And this is important because there are some observables which are related to the Higgs. So identifying the Higgs is useful in Sarah. Okay? We have done the same for the pseudo-scalar mixing matrix, but that was actually not necessary. And also let me show you, there is also this set set, which is the mixing matrix that we have used for the uh, neutral gauge motions. You can see it here, set set. Usually this is given by a 2 by 2 matrix because you have the photon and the set. Now we have three, the, the photon, the set and the set prime. So you, in, in addition to the Weimar angle or weak angle, you have this weak prime angle. So you have to parameterize the matrix with two angles instead of one. Okay? But that's the only subtle thing. Actually this is again optional, this dependence. If you introduce this dependence in all the analytical expressions, the matrix will be substituted by this expression. If not, it will just give, give you matrix and some indices, which is also fine. But if you want to get some feeling about what is going on, this might be useful. Okay, so the rest of the, the, the file is basically the same we have for the scotogenic model, so I will skip it. Also, we have these particles. Okay, and in these particles, I only wanted to mention couple of details. Okay, so we have this HH, which are the oh, here, which are the mass eigenstates for the CP even scalars, and we have two. So in our definition, we say that this is the Higgs, but in the PDG code, we give two numbers instead of one, because there are two Higgs, not only one. Also, let me mention that so we have the Higgs get the same code. No, the first one is 25 and the second one 35. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Also, we have a set prime. Okay. We use this description because the set prime also appears in some other models, so we take advantage of that. And we specify that the goldstone that this guy is going to eat is the second uh, pseudo scalar. The first one was for the set, and you can see it right below, uh, above. Okay. Uh, here I have another question. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, in the, the CP odd uh, mixing metrics that you've written there, both the eigenvalues are zero, right? Because yes. they're massless. But how can you define which is your first uh, goldstone and which is the second goldstone? Because they're degenerate eigenvalues. That has to do with uh, the way you have defined the matrix. So, I have assigned the first element is the one that is coming from the standard model X. Okay, then the hypercharges to two directions in the degenerates of space. The yeah. hypercharge assignments, all you have to do is normalize them. The, 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 I mean, it, the, the, the eigenvalues are different, but the origin of these eigenvalues is different, right? And make them orthogonal. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have a you need physical insight to know that. The first one will be, in this case, related to the normal Higgs, and the second one related to the new Higgs. So you know that the first one is the set and the second one is the prime. But we need some physical information. I mean, you know the Z longitudinal, so you just construct the orthogonal normalized combination. Yeah, but you don't need to do that. I mean, Sarah does it for you. So you just have to say the first one will be this and the second one will be that. But you need some physical input. Okay, this is everything I wanted to say from parameters. So uh, let's start running. So I also put uh, this file uh, here, sorry, this Ramsara Dark VS that you can find in the website. So let me open it. Okay. So as usual, you just <coughs> load Sara, then load the model, which in this case is Dark VS, not the photogenic model. Okay. You see, this was a question before. So Sara checks for anomalies. 
If there is an anomaly, you get a warning. The model continues, everything is fine, but you get a warning. There is an anomaly. In this case, everything is fine. Okay, it's done. And now we can print some information on the screen, like the magnitude for the chunk leptons, which is not 3x3 three three anymore, because we have this mixing with these additional vector-like fermions, which have a mass, and mix thanks to this lambda air coupling, so you can see that everything makes sense. And this is the mixing of the mass matrix array in the CP event sector. So this is, I mean, there is a mixing which is coming from this lambda HP, which is nothing but this, I mean, a mixed term of the type lambda HP H squared phi squared, which I didn't write here, as you can imagine, times the two beds, and that's it. Okay? Now, uh, for the cotogenic model, I showed you that one can use a different command for each uh, output uh, that you want. For example, if you want a sphere output, we have this make sphere. If you want a uh, micro mega, you have this make carpet. If you want a macro, make UFO. Right? But there is also a command that makes everything sim uh, in one step, which is this make all. Okay? So I will execute it now because it takes like uh, five minutes. So I will, I will do it and then I will continue discussing why this is computed. Because otherwise we will have to wait until it's done. Okay? So this will create at the same time all the different outputs. So MagGraph, Spino and MicroMega. Okay? It takes some time, like uh, five minutes or so in my lab. And now, while this is working, let me show you the other uh, model file that we have which is this spino.m file. Yes, I suppose that the, that the common make all is not loading the, the RGs. No, RG is not, they are not. That's only only uh, output, like uh, spino, micro, micro mega. Okay. And LaTeX, also, LaTeX. As well. And you get this LaTeX file that we saw in the first session. Okay, so let me open the spino.m, which is the only one that we didn't mention so far. Okay, and you see that it's exactly the same that we did for the cotogenic model. So this is a non-supersymmetric model, so we just have to care about low energy input. So we use exactly the same command that we used in that case. Now we have a list of parameters, which are later here below matched to the parameters of the model. We have also here a list of particles we want to calculate the decay for. And we have also here the parameters to solve the problems. So let me make just a couple of comments on this file because it's, as you can see, exactly the same as in the cosmogenic model. But there is a nice difference. The first one is that you see that now we have two different parameters to solve the problems. Is it because we have two beds? So we need, we have two conditions in the scalar potential, and we need to select two different uh, couplings or parameters to solve the problems. And as I told you, the first day. It is very convenient to use always quadratic terms, like uh, square masses, because that way there will always be an analytical solution. This is important. If you don't do that, you may be in trouble. But if you do that, you are safe. And the second comment I wanted to make is that in this model there are two parameters that we didn't have in the scotogenic model, which are the bed of the new phi field, what we call VP, to remember, and we have also the new gauge capital. These are two free parameters of the model. But you know that due to this relation, the, the bed and the gauge capital are related to the set prime ones. So actually, if you take these three parameters, one of them can be computed in terms of the other. <coughs> What's in your opinion more uh, physically relevant? The bed or the set prime ones? So I can imagine that if you want to do a phenomenological analysis of your model, the set prime mass will be more important for you. You want to fix the mass to some value, and then you calculate the value. So we take advantage of that here. So we give input not for the value, which is the fundamental parameter, but for the set prime mass, which is given here, and for the gauge coupling. And then when you initialize the fundamental parameters, you initialize the gauge coupling to what you have selected here, and you initialize the value to what it has to be. So the set prime mass divided by two times the gauge capital. So indirectly, you are giving input to the bed. 
but instead of doing that directly, you do it through the, the separate ones. And you can do all sorts of combinations of this type if you have some relations in your model. The important thing is that in the end, all the fundamental parameters need to have an input value. But whether you give this input value directly or with some combinations, that's not a problem. You can choose. And we have said also here, just for simplicity, the mixings in the U1, the U1 mixing to zero. But this is a choice. You could have here whatever you want. You can also have input values and choose for it. For a different point, you can choose a different value and play with it. Okay. But this is a choice. And that's it. Okay. So now Sarah is running, calculating the spin of code. And just out of curiosity, uh, if you put this G1x and Gx1 to be zero, the kinetic mixing, then, then uh, does J prime couple to the like standard model fermions? Yes, but through fermion mixing. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, 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 I mean, this model is motivated by some flavor anomalies. So you want, in the end, to have some effects of this set prime in the standard model fermion. Otherwise, you don't do it. And you do that with these couplings. So when this phi gets a f, the standard model fermions mix with the new fermion, with the vector like fermions. And since these guys couple to the set prime, indirectly you are coupling the set prime to the standard model fermions. This is the idea behind the model. If not, if we didn't have those couplings, then, as you say, we would need the U1 mixing to have the coupling. Otherwise, they don't come. Running, we have to wait a little bit, unfortunately. Okay. okay, in the meantime, we can already prepare the Sphino code. So, once this is done, we will get Sphino code and we would like to uh, compile it. So, we have to go to Sphino. Okay, this is exactly what, exactly what we did uh, on Tuesday. And then we have to create a new folder called DarkBS, like the model. Okay, we will copy all the Sphino files to that folder when this is done. Hope that it doesn't take too much. Okay, well, let me continue, maybe. We will first begin with this parameter point. So let me say a few words. So the gauge coupling, we are going to take it to be 1. Okay. We are going to put a set prime at the 40B. Okay. And then we will select by hand this particular choice for the lambda coupling. So this is the coupling with the, the third generation quark, second generation quark, and third generation quark, and the same for the leptons. So you see that the set prime will only couple indirectly through this mixing with muons, not with electrons and not with muons. And also you see that the set prime will not couple to the first generation quarks, because we have put a zero in that coupling. Also, the vector-like fermions, we have a mass at the 1 TV, more or less level, and these are the rest of the parameters. For, also, for simplicity, some of them have been set to zero. Yes, this is a choice. This is a beta point. Okay? So let's see if Sarah is finished. Yeah, this is just one example. Parameter point. It's about to finish with the spin -off. Sphino has finished and now it's creating the code for the other tools. So we can already use this one. Okay, so I copy the files which are now in um, in output. Now there will be DarkBS because we are executing this. Electroic symmetry breaking and then Sphino. We copy them to this DarkBS, okay, and then we, we, we write the compilation command, which is make model equal DarkBS, and then start compiling. And in the meantime, this is finished, so we have already the input files for, uh, I mean, the LaTeX files, the UFO files, which are used for uh, bug graph, 
There are some warnings, but they are not relevant, so trust me. You will see that it works without any problem. And we can close this file, we don't need it anymore. Now this is compiling. Also, you can see that I put also an example of a Lesus input file for this model. And this example point corresponds exactly to this benchmark point. Okay, if I open it, you can see. Okay, this is the these are the values that I have here, but translated into this the source format. You see, zero, three, ten to the minus three, zero, one, zero, exactly the same. And in this model, there are not many parameters. Only with these parameters, we define the complete model. So I have to copy this file to Spin as well. So copy this the source to. To a skin. Still compiling, when it's compiled, we can run it. We don't need this anymore. It's finished. So we have here in this bin folder we have a new binary file which is the binary files of this code. And we can run it exactly as we did with the, the code folder. Spin of RBS. And then it finishes and we have a new output file, this spin of SPC RBS, which corresponds to this parameter point that we have selected. So we can have a look at the, at the, at the results just to, to get some feeling about this parameter point. So again, this is a huge file, so everything is divided in blocks. And in particular, one of the most relevant blocks is the block called mass, which is here. And here you can see the masses of the particles in the model. So we have a Higgs of 120, a little bit too light. Then we have a second Higgs, which is uh, 632, also too light to be the 750 GB resonance. Then we have the cell, the cell prime at exactly 40 B, because this was the input value. Then W plus. This is the, the chi field, which is our dark matter candidate, so 1.7 TB. And then we have the standard model fermion, we have an additional fermion with a mass of 1 TB, an additional downward. Also we have an additional upward, also with a mass of 1 TB. Then the three charged leptons in the standard model, the electron, the muon, the tau, and an additional fermion with a mass of 1.7 TB. And finally, in this model, neutrinos are massless, exactly massless. So we have three zeros here. And finally, we have these additional neutrinos which have a mass of 1.7 T, and they form a pair, a direct pair. Okay? And now we have also here the mixing matrices, everything, also some low energy observables, flavor observables in the core sector, which are zero, but they are not initialized. This is because we choose not to compute them, to make it faster. And also the decays. Here you have the branching ratio for each particle into the different channels. For, for example, the set prime, let me find it here. The set prime decays in all these different channels. So it decays mainly to <coughs> yes, here and here. So to downworks and to upworks part of the new channel. So the heavy exotic downworks and the heavy exotic uh, upworks. With a branching ratio of 0.4 for each case. Okay. So we are done with the scheme. We already implemented the model, we created the spin output, we ran the spin, we got the results. Questions? Okay. So the next thing, let's compute the, the relic density for that matter in this parameter point. So for this we have to use micromegas and it's super simple. We just have to repeat what we did on Wednesday. So I go to micromegas and 
I remind you that one of the things you have to do is you have to create a new project. It is done with this new project. And then Dark VS. This is the name that we are going to give to the project. Now we have a new folder, which you can see here, Dark VS. And if you go inside, you have more folders. And then in Word, Word Models, there is nothing. And we have to copy the calhead output of Sarah into this folder. This is exactly what we did in the photogenic model when we wanted to use the photogenic in microfilms. So I copy. Okay, this is in codes. And then Sarah output dark ps simulation rating and then calhead. Okay, I copy all these files here. Okay, and we have again the usual four model files in the language that Micromegas knows how to read and these additional CPP files which are the main programs that we are going to run in Micromegas. Since I'm only interested in calculating the relative density, I will use only this one. I remind you that this one also includes the calculation of the detection rates. I'm just repeating exactly what I did in session uh, 2 with my Micromegas. So I take, sorry, I take this file and I copy it, for example, let me, I copy it here, so to the main folder in the project, so I copy, or uh, models, calc, omega, ctp, I copy it here, then I compile it, and this is done with main, main equal calc omega, dot ctp, it compiles, very fast, Okay. So I get a new binary file, this is the binary file to run uh, Micromegas. And now I have to run it, but for that I need input value for the parameters, which, I remind you, I can take directly from the Sphero output. So the Sphero output file will be the input file for Micromegas. Because, again, this is the same format and we can take advantage of that. So I copy. This Spino, Spino SPC dot RBS, I copy it here. Okay. Here it is, and now we can run Calcom. Okay. I know that I'm going today very fast, but this is because I'm just repeating exactly the same that I did for the photogenic model. So there is nothing new, nothing different. It's just a different model with a few more ingredients, but the process is exactly the same. So I just run Calcomega. And then it completes. So it has identified that our dark matter particle is this sky field with a mass of 1.7 TV or 1,700 GV. And then now it's computing, solving the Boltzmann equations and calculating the relative density. It takes like one minute or so. Ah, even less. Okay, so the important information is here. As usual, this is the free cell temperature and, most important, the omega dark matter in this point. In this case, this point would be nice because you see that the relative density is 0.1, which is more or less what the cosmological observation tells. So this point is more or less okay regarding dark matter. Maybe a little bit too high, but not too much. And also, Micromegas tells you which are the most important channels that set the dark matter relative density, and as we expected, these are chi chi into these down quarks and up quarks of the fourth family, so the exotic quarks. And this is because the diagrams that are mediating this annihilation cross section are, uh, sorry, well, this is a scalar, so chi chi, which is our dark matter particle, then with a set prime. And then here you have this U4, U4, or D4, D4. And you remember that the, we checked that in this parameter point, the branching ratio of the set prime into these guys is dominant. So that's why this is the channel that dominates the dark the matter fairly density. So everything makes sense. Okay, so 
I move to the next code. So we saw already how to use Micromega, and we saw again how to use it because we did exactly the same. And you see that it's super simple. I mean, we just have to repeat exactly the same steps that we followed when we did it for the first time in, in the Cotogenic model. So the next code is MATGRAPH, so we are going to do a MATGRAPH simulation with this model. And today I promise that we are going to discover something. So we are going to do something a little bit more complicated than what we did for the Cotogenic model. Because this model has something else, some more flavor, more, more material to play with. Okay? We are going to do this simulation here. So PP, so proton on proton, LHC physics, going into mu plus mu minus, okay? A mu and anti mu. Why am I why uh, am I interested in that channel? Because I know that the set prime couples with a very large capping to muons. So I hope to see something related to my set prime in that uh, in that channel. Let's see if that is true. Okay, so proton proton, mu plus mu minus. But as I told you yesterday, if I just do that, I will pick up the process I'm interested in, which is basically so proton proton is all the components of the proton into set prime and mu plus mu minus. But I will also pick up all the other possible mechanisms that produce a mu plus and a mu minus. For example, I can produce a C, a Higgs and many other things, and they will also produce in the end a new plus new minus. So, since I'm not only interested in the total cross-section, because the total cross-section doesn't tell me much of my physics, the physics that I'm interested in, which is the set prime, I'm going to study some kinematical distributions of this new plus and new minus in the final step. And I hope to be able to see something in these kinematical distributions that show that there is a new particle that is produced in this model. Okay? However, before I do that, I have to change something in the parameter point I was using because, let me show you again this parameter point in this parameter point you remember that I said that the set prime does not couple to the first generation quarks and you know that the first generation quarks are the main components of the proton the second and the third generation are less present in the proton so I will change this to a new parameter point where I have a one here because I want the set prime to have a large coupling with the first generation of quarks. I mean, if you do it with zero, there is no problem. Everything will run and you will get results, but you will see nothing. There is no physics that you can see there. So I put a one because I want, I mean, I'm, I'm hacking the file, or if you want the, the physics to get what I want. I put a one. And also, in this point, the set prime had a mass of 400, uh, 40 V. Also, the cross section for production of the set prime is really low when the mass is so high. So I will put 300 GV, which is experimentally excluded, okay, because I want to see something. Otherwise, I wouldn't see anything. The cross section would be tiny, and the number of events I would need to see a, something in my plots would be a huge number, and my computer doesn't kind of do it. So I, I, I have this new parameter point where physics would be more transparent. So the first thing that I can do is I can go to Sphino, change the input file, so Sphino, change the Lechou file that I use for this model with these new parameters. So I want now a set prime with uh, only 300 GB. So I change it here, 300. And I want the coupling to the first generation quarks to be as large as possible. So let's say one. You can make it even larger, but let's say one. Okay? I save it. Then I run. Okay? And I have this new Spino SPC DARBS file that I will use later in MATGRAPH. Okay, this is the new parameter point that I have here. Okay, I go to MATGRAPH, for example here. Uh, actually, let me do it here. Okay, and now, unfortunately, uh, this is the first thing in the course I will not do in front of you because it takes about half an hour, okay? So, in order to say something, I need a lot of events because otherwise, even though the set prime only has a 300 GB mass, the number of events you need to see something physically is uh, 100,000. This in my laptop takes like uh, half an hour to, to run completely. 
So I did the simulation already, and I have the result for you. And we will analyze the result, okay? But in any case, I will show you how I will do the simulation, and then before I do the final click, do it, I will stop, and we will analyze the results, okay? So the simulation starts by putting here the information about the model. So we have to go to models, and then in models, we have to create this dark BS model, okay? And then inside that folder, we have to copy the UFO output of Sarah, which is the, the format that Barca knows how to work. So I copy Sarah uh, output dark PS, uh, doing symmetry breaking, and then finally UFO. I copy everything to this dark PS folder that we just created. Okay, that's there. And now we can use already uh, MathGraph with that, uh, with that model. So we open MathGraph, beam, then, uh, sorry, MG5 AMC, then MathGraph loads. Okay. Now we are inside MathGraph, we have to load the model we are going to study. So this is done with import model, then the name of the model that we have already decided to be DarkPS. And then I remind you that we have to use this tag model name or model names. Model. Okay? So we have loaded the model in MATLAB, then you have to generate the process, which in this case will be generate pp into new flat new minus, which is called E2, E2 bar. These are the names that we are using for the new plus, sorry, for the new minus and the new plus. Okay? Then you have to output all this information into a new folder, <coughs> following the same terms we follow. So output, and I will use, uh, I don't know, scene, dbs2, because one is already picked up by the, the one I did before. Okay, this creates a new folder, which you can see here. Okay, we have this scene dbs2 that we just created. Okay, and next you launch the process. Okay, so you launch it. You can even do launch. Okay, the simulation I did was totally complete. So it means it means that I did also hibernation and showering, and I did also detect a response. So I simulated the whole process at the edge. So for this here, you have to select two. Okay? If you select zero, it's the basic uh, simulation at the partonic level. If you select one, you include hydronization and showering. And if you select two, you do everything and you <coughs> also do the detector simulation. Okay? Two. Now it, it tells you that if you select two, you have to select one as well, because you have to pass through the harmonization of showering, you say, okay, I know that. And then it tells you, okay, I'm going to start the, the run, but before I do that, tell me what are the parameters, what are the, the, the conditions of your simulation. And for this, uh, there are two things that you have to change. The first, as I told you, you have to say two to change the run count. Okay? This opens this file where you can change the conditions of the simulation, the setup, if you want. And, as I told you, if you do it with 10,000 events, this doesn't work, so you have to use more events. So, 100,000. Okay, you save. And, well, before you close, you can also take advantage that now MacGraph is waiting for you to close the file, and in the meantime, also you can do the, the parameters. Okay? So, inside the folder, PBS2, there is this folder cards, where you have all these cards for the simulation. This is one of them, this is the run card, which is here. Okay? And there is also the param card with the parameters of the model. And then we are going to do exactly what we did yesterday. We are going to copy the output of Sphino as input here. So I copy. Uh, the Sphino output, 
in SPC RBS, and I copy it here and have to rename it as param. Okay, I have to give it exactly the same name that it has here. Okay, so now we can close this. And now here I would say, oh, I'm done. And then the simulation would start. Okay? This is what I would do if I wanted to do the simulation. However, now I cannot do it because otherwise it would take half an hour and also the, the laptop would be collapsed <laughs> and it finishes. Okay? Because it's a lot of information, 100,000. Uh, maybe with a normal computer, I mean a, a desktop, it works better. Okay. Okay, so let me show you the result. Okay? Suppose you did, yes, I'm done. Okay, actually I should say probably cancel. No? I don't know how to cancel. <laughs> How can I cancel this? Maybe control C? Yeah. Yes, control C works always. Okay. <laughs> so here in my graph I have this folder that I did this morning basically by doing what I did but doing the last step. Okay. And inside we have basically the same, but in addition we have these events. Okay. In the events folder we have well, we also have another folder which is called run one. So let's go to run one. This is the run that I did this morning. So all the output of the simulation uh, is saved in these different files. Each file corresponds to the output at each different step in the simulation. So for example, the await events, is the, this file is the file that appears when you finish the partonic level simulation. The PTI, uh, no sorry, not this one, these PTI events, these files are produced when you finish the second step and the PGS events are the, is the file that appears when you finish the last step. So this is the, the most complete file that you have here. Now if you open it, which I won't do because it would take uh, a lot of memory, uh, you would see that you have the information for all the events. So each random event that you have generated has information about the, final, the particles in the final state, the energy, the different rapidity, blah blah blah, direction, all the information about the process. So now we have to read that information, make some plots, and see whether we can discover a new particle or not. Okay? And for this, I think I told you this already yesterday, you can do it by yourself, because I mean these files can be read in Fortran, in C++, in root, in many different languages, and then you can do your own code. But it is also useful to use something that people have developed that is called MAD analysis. Okay, this MAD analysis is a code independent to, to MATRA, I mean, this is done even by other people, which is used to read the output of MATRA. Okay? With MAD analysis, you don't have to do this programming to read the files. They did it for you. It's super nice. I, I really like this code. And like MATRA, it's in Python. So you just have to untar and use. You don't need to compile anything. But you need root. So you need to have root installed in your, in your computer. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So, just enter and then okay sorry one question before you mm -hmm. go on uh, all the information on the detector uh, is already there in MATLAB I guess but the I parameters see. of the detector you yeah mean. you can change that it's it's one of the cards okay in one of the cards let me show you actually you can select whether you want to use ALDA or CMS okay and if you do that, you select the standard parameters of Atlas and the standard parameters of CMS. Okay, so it's by default there. Okay. But, but you can also, I think I used Atlas because Atlas is the one by default. Okay. Which is nice because people here are the working out. <laughs> but uh, you can also play with that. For example, you can say, okay, I want the efficiency of my detector in this energy to be this. Okay. Which is a slightly different from the one they give in the, in the paper, for example. But then you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. Because <laughs> this information is complicated. But it's true. I mean, let me show you very quickly. So, it's in the cards. There is one called uh, PGS card. Okay? This is the one we use. Okay? And there are two templates, Atlas and CMS. So, you just have to copy one of them and rename it as uh, PGS card. Okay? And if you open it, you see that it's, I mean, you can even understand what it means. But, okay. So, the eta cells in the calorimeter. <laughs> 320, yeah. it's obvious, right? <laughs> okay. and, and all these numbers. And you can change all of them and, and do the simulation with different numbers. Okay? 
So with this you can even do predictions, no? Like, okay, if the LHC improves in such a way, blah, 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 I don't know, my process will look like this. If it doesn't improve, it will look like Okay, so now we can just read the, the results and see whether we discover a particle or not. So we go to bad analysis, which we just open, and, okay, uh, I also put... Uh, and mad analysis can be used exactly like macro. So you enter the program and you start typing commands, okay, like in macro. But both mad graph and mad analysis can also be used in a different way. You can write a list of instructions and, and, and give them to the give this list to the program, and then the program, without opening anything, runs these instructions and gives you the result, okay. And this is what I'm going to do with mad analysis because I prefer to do it like that, okay. And for this, also in the website, you can find a, a file called plot.bs. So these are the instructions that I'm going to give to math analysis to get the plot that I want. Okay? And they are very simple. But I have to move or copy this file to math analysis. So I copy to math analysis. I go to math analysis. It's here. So let me show you the file. It's very simple also. And this is one thing that I really like about bad analysis, that with very little information, you can do a lot of things. So there are three lines. The first line is import the data. So you are telling the location, you are telling the code where is the location of this data, which in my computer is this one. Okay? In this location, I have these events, run one, you remember this file, right? This tag one PGS events. So this is the output file that we generated when we did the, the simulation. Okay? Then next, you have to say what plot you want to make. Okay? And in this case, I said, I want the invariant mass of mu plus mu minus. Okay? I want, I don't remember exactly this. Because I don't have, okay. And I want the, the data to be distributed in 100 bins. Okay? This is the first number. They go from 50 GB to 500 GB and in logarithmic scale, both for the invariant mass and for the number of events. So we are going to get a plot with number of events as a function of the invariant mass of the mu plus and the mu minus. And both the x and the y axis will be in logarithmic scale. This is what we are saying in this line. You can even add more plots if you want. You can say, okay, I want another plot with this other information. I want another plot with this information. And this will be more lines in this file. Okay? And also you can even uh, set cuts. For example, you can say exclude points where the invariant mass is below, I don't know, 200 GB. I'm not interested in those. And this is done with a command which is reject. So you say reject. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but it would be something like this. Reject below 200. As simple as that. And you can add as many conditions as you want. And each condition will take the events that you produce and uh, eliminate some of them according to these to this restrictions that you have implemented in this file. You are not uh, erasing any data. It's just I, I cut on this point. I don't want them in my plot. Okay? But I'm not going to do that. Okay? Because I want the, the complete plot. Okay? And then the last line is just submit to a new folder. And in this folder, the information will be saved. So it's very simple to produce the plot. Okay? I can close it. And then the way to run math analysis with this file is bin, which is the, binary, the folder where the binary file is, mn5, this is the name of the binary. Then you have to use this minus r. This is a technicality. This is because uh, the files we are going to read have been produced by PGS. When it's PGS, you have to do this minus R, but this is a technicality. And then the name of our file, this plot .rbs txt. Okay? So, now my analysis is working. Do you know how the integrated version of my analysis works with the, with the inside Matra? I know you can do it inside Matra, but um, I don't like it, to be honest, because I like to, anal to analyze the data independently. So I never used it. I don't know. You can also use math analysis inside macro. You have to install the additional piece and, and things like that. And I, 
Okay, now the, always there is a question how many cores you want to use in the calculation. So by default you say all of them and that's it. And maybe you have a computer with 100 co uh, cores and some of them are used by some astrophysical simulation and you don't have to use it. This is up to you. And now it takes some time. It's actually a little bit slow, but okay, in the end it works. Remind you, we are going to see a plot of our simulation where we have the number of events as a function of the invariant mass of mu plus mu minus, okay? In different beams for different invariant masses, from 50 to 500 GB. Let's see what we see. Any guess? <laughs> Okay, it finished. Now you see that there is a new folder called Darby's plot because we have saved our results in this folder. And here you have uh, the results in different <coughs> formats in LaTeX. You have it in LaTeX, you have it in PDF, <coughs> in HTML, so you can open it in many different ways. <coughs> and you can also do it from mad analysis, and I will do it from mad analysis. You can say open. And then uh, plot, Darby's plot, and then let's say PDF. Okay, I will open the PDF that has been generated. You can also do it like uh, with uh, Acrory, okay, independently I mean, from here. But also you can do it from inside my analysis. And this uh, has been just created by by my analysis. This is the result of our uh, simulation. Okay. Generated by Avelino, okay, basically one minute ago, half a minute ago. Okay, this is the people that did bad analysis, so they want merit for that. Okay, and this is the result. So you have some information about your commands you, uh, the commands you used, the configuration of the system, blah blah blah. So you see. And then information about the data sets, how many events you had, uh, okay, where this was coming from, I mean the, the folder where it was and finally, the term, the plot this is our plot so, we have two peaks in this plot the first one is basically at 91 GB so you can guess what particle we have discovered here and there is another peak, not that large, but another peak at exactly, you can see the, the labels at exactly 300 GB so we have discovered in this plot two particles. We have the Z boson, which decays into mu plus mu minus, and we have the Z prime, which is this peak here. So that's it. I mean, with, with the mat graph, you can do these type of simulations. Uh, in a complete work, like for a paper, you would have to simulate the background as well, because maybe there is background from the standard model, and then you don't see this peak so clearly. But this is basically the idea. And then with mat analysis, you can produce this plots, you can uh, you know, overlap different plots, you can do many, many different things. How can you put the merge, the background and the scene and the plot? Uh, for this, I think there is a common, I think it's merge or something. Or, I'm not sure, but uh, you can do it, you can do it. I mean, uh, mad analysis is really powerful because it uses root. So everything you can do with root, you can do with mad analysis. And it's specialized for this type of output. Is not the background has already taken care of here? In the, the new, because you said P, P, P2 mu plus mu minus, so it's automatically... Okay, the standard model background, yes, but if you have a different background, like for example, misidentified mutes, for example, this you have to do it by yourself, and this is a bit tricky. Or, uh, yes, basically this type of things, an efficiency, things like that. But, I mean, yes, here we have everything, we have the... Uh, the signal that is coming from our set prime and the signal that is coming from the rest of particles. That's why we have this peak, for example. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, that background is included, but there might be other backgrounds that we have not included. 
Okay, questions? Okay, then we are done for today. For today we repeated everything and I hope it's clear more or less what is the different uh, what are the different steps that we take every time we have a new model. Tomorrow, which is the last session, first I will talk a little bit, not much, about something called flavor tip, which is a, a different a tool that is somehow integrated in SARA, it's part of SARA, uh, that is used to calculate several observables. But I will just give you very few, I mean, just a few details and something very brief. And then I will just let you ask questions. I mean, I know that some of you try to do this at home. Some of you found problems, so maybe it's time for you to, to tell me about them. And if there are no problems, we just say goodbye. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's it. See you tomorrow.